Until you get back, brother, to start. Hey, I did that with Don. What's that? I told you I had that money today, but it's only 20. You can't bring it out. I might want to keep on to an active year. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. That's funny. We're going to give Brother Eli a moment to get back since there's so many of us this morning. Psalm 125, and I'll go ahead and read it, and keep in mind we'll keep our eyes peeled for key verses, key phrases, key words, anything that might sum up this chapter using either one of those three things. But Psalm 125, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good, and to them that are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity, but peace shall be upon Israel. When we look at this psalm, it is a psalm of trust and comfort. Now we're going to start digging into it and dying apart like we would any other chapter of the Bible if we're going to try to study it in detail. So when we look at it, we know we're looking at one of the Psalms of, deg of Degrees. The Psalms of Degrees are Psalms of Ascent. They are also known as are those songs that the Jews sang as they traveled each year to Jerusalem to make their sacrifices. Now when we're looking at Psalm 125, are there any key verse or key verses that might sum up this whole thing, that would summarize chapter 125? What is that, Sister Breath? Verse 1. And what does verse 1 read? They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abideth forever. And that, I would say, sums up Psalm 125 in a nutshell. Does anybody else have any other verses to add to it? Or is, is verse 1 pretty much the verse that sums it all up? I think we're pretty confident in saying that verse 1 sums up Psalms 125. Now let's go a little bit smaller. Are there any key phrases that might sum up this verse or this chapter? Verse 1. 
in Psalm 125. He phrases. I agree, agree with you, brother. When I was going over Psalm 125, to find a key phrase is a hard one, but I agree with you to do good because we're talking about having trust and comfort in God. And when we read through, especially towards the end of Psalm 125, we find that the only ones that really have comfort are those that trust in the Lord. So if they do good, that would basically sum it up. Now what about key words. Is there a word or words that would sum up 125? A word or words that would basically take the chapter of Psalm 125 and sum it up. We could say trust. Is there anything else? I threw in peace. And also I have the word abideth because when we look at Psalm 125, when it's describing uh, the trust that we have in God, it said that it abides forever. There's nothing that can shake it. Now, one thing I love to do is the Psalms are extremely prophetic. They really are. So I like to see if there's any of the Psalms that were quoted in the New Testament. When it comes to Psalm 125, it does not appear that it was quoted anywhere in the New Testament. We know that the book of Psalms is a collection of Psalms that were meant to be sung in the temple. Around uh, in the temple, it was put together by David. The book of Psalms was compiled by David as one of the compilers of three, but David started it to be sung in the temple. And with Psalms comes poetry, it comes lyrics, comes music. And I like to throw out if I can discover what kind of poetic style it is, but I cannot come up with it on my own. I'm not comfortable enough to say this is definitely it because I'm not a Hebrew poetic style, um, poetry scholar. But if I can discover it, I will throw out anything I have. Can find, I don't really see any real history of the psalm itself to be mentioned of. And when it comes to divisions, the only thing I can really come up with is there's a change in verses 4 and 5 to where it changes to a prayer. Now, Jesus Christ can be seen throughout the entire Bible. Old Testament and New. Everywhere we look, we look in the temple, it points to Jesus Christ. We look in the tabernacle, it points to Jesus Christ. We look at Joseph, Moses, they're types of Jesus Christ. When we look for Jesus Christ in Psalm 125, according to Keith L. Brooks, Christ is seen in this manner. Those who trust in God live within ramparts of his loving care forever. For his Son is made our High Priest, while the Holy Spirit is made our constant companion. Now we're going to dive into Psalm 125 and begin studying it in a little bit more detail. And is there anything about the very first verse that just pops right out at us? We've mentioned it time and time again in all of the other Psalms we've looked at for the most part. Is a four letter word. All the letters are not small, but they're all big. I know I'm fishing a little bit. In the very first verse, if we go and read it, it reads, They that trust in the Lord. In the Lord. And what's so special about the Lord? I already mentioned it here with the last 
30 seconds to a minute. Capital letters. It's all capital letter, letters. Now for us that means something special because in the King James Version of the Bible, whenever you see Lord in all caps, it means that He is Jehovah. And if we look throughout the Word of God, we see that there are different names for God, but when it comes to Jehovah, it means anything you need Him to be, that is exactly what He is for you. So when we look at Jehovah, it is all compassing. It is anything you need Him to be. So they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Does anybody know anything about Mount Zion? Where is Mount Zion? You're extremely, extremely close. Mount Jerusalem is, Mount Jerusalem, Mount Zion is not in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem is built on Mount Zion. Mount Zion um, is a place where Jerusalem resides, is the hill where the temple resides. So it is a physical location. And it is also symbolic to some of the, to the Jews for particular reasons. And it should be symbolic for us for the same reasons as well. Because what does Psalm 48 and verse 2 read? Psalm 48 and verse 2. So when we look at Mount Zion, it represents joy, it represents victory. Even here in verse 1, it states that Mount Zion cannot be removed, and it will abide forever. So it is the way to joy, it is the way to victory. What does Obadiah chapter 1 verse 17 state concerning Mount Zion? Obadiah 1 and verse 17. So Mount Zion, as we saw in Psalm 48, is up the way to joy and victory. And in Obadiah, he says that it is a place of deliverance and holiness. If we go to physical Mount Zion, which is where Jerusalem is, that's where the temple was, what made it back then the way to joy and victory and the uh, place of deliverance and holiness? It's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the presence of God dwelt. We cannot do things on our own. We can try to get deliverance over things, and sometimes we are victorious. And sometimes it's only short-lived. But what makes the deliverance last forever? What breaks every chain? What makes it so precious? If we look in, in Exodus chapter 2, I believe it is, and we don't have to turn there, but we find that Moses is confronted by the angel in the burning bush. And what did the angel tell Moses to do? He told him to take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. What made that ground holy? I mean, that bush has been there for probably a while. That ground has been there since the creation of the world. What all of a sudden made that ground holy? It was the presence of God that made it a holy place. That's what made it a clean place. Because God cannot dwell with unholy people. He cannot live with corruption. He cannot dwell with sin. It has to be pure. It has to be clean. 
And where God is, there's holiness, there's purity, there is deliverance. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, but my burden is light. His anointing breaks the yoke. So it's the presence of God that brings is the way to joy, to victory, to deliverance, to our holiness. Be ye holy, for I am holy. What cleanses this corrupted flesh? Because for all have sinned and come uh, fallen short of the glory of God. What has changed that in the first place? It's only the presence of God. It's the working of the Holy Ghost. Because it is, an, even when it comes to holiness, it's an everyday battle. Every day, Lord, take away the desires of my heart and give me the desires of your heart. God, let me be more like you. God, take away my mind and give me the mind of Jesus Christ. As Paul wrote, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. As David prayed, God created me a clean heart. God, take away my heart and give me your heart. What makes the difference? What changes us? It is the presence of God. It is the working of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Now, if we're going to back up and do a study study on Mount Zion, there are actually two different Mount Zions. There's one where Jerusalem is and where the temple was, but there's one in one other location. If someone would please read Revelation 14.1, Revelation 14.1, and I will find Hebrews. Does someone have Revelation 14.1?
So when we look at these mountains, they are around about Jerusalem. What is important about a mountain when it comes to um, warfare? In the words of Trump, they protect the valley. In the words of Trump, location, location, location. Mountains help protect the surrounding area. If the enemy comes in from the valley, you're overwatching. In the early days, probably about the times of Christopher Columbus, if you go over to the Mediterranean Sea, there's what's known as the Strait of Gibraltar. That's where you enter into the Mediterranean Sea. It's narrower than the rest of the sea. They, people and uh, countries would actually battle over that central point and place cannons over there. That way, if any ship was coming in that they didn't want in there, they could blast them out of the water. They would sit on top of the mountain range and fire down below. The person that is on a mountain is at an advantage. They can see surrounding. If your mountain is um, higher up, you can see everything going on around you in the valley. If it comes to, if we would ever go over to, oh, the Red Rose City. Why can't I think of that city? Over in the Middle East, there is a crescent moon shaped uh, cavern. I am forgetting Petra. It's believed that's where the Jews will flee during the tribulation period. But there's a small, narrow canyon that leads into that entrance. Whoever, and it's the only way into that cavern system. So whoever's on top can throw down stones, they can shoot down, they have the advantage. Mountains provide a strategic advantage point. And the Bible states, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth evermore. God is surrounding his people. He's not just fighting for them and trying to protect them, but he has the best advantage point that anyone could ever have when it comes to battle. He looks down and he sees everything that is going on in excuse me, your life and my life. And as long as we belong to God, he is making sure that no harm will come to us. And if, this, if that verse isn't enough, what does the book of Psalms state concerning the angels of God? They encamp around those that fear him. God has a protective watch on his people, and there is, a, there is nothing like it in this world or in the spiritual, I hate to use the spiritual, because really when we look at the spiritual, I believe it's just the invisible part of God's creation. I mean, just because we don't see angels around us right now doesn't mean that they're not physically there. Just because we may not see God right now does not mean he's not physically seated on the throne of heaven. He's physically there. It's not like there's a whole other dimension or realm, quote unquote. He is ever present. And he's watching out for his people. And it's a protection that will abide forever and cannot be penetrated. You know, as long as we serve God, the devil cannot do anything to us that God does not permit him to do. He cannot get through God as a protection. He has to take that up with God first. But even if he thinks he can do whatever he wants. He knows better than that. Because what did God say about Job? He goes, you can do whatever you want, Job. What was that? That was God lowering his hedge of protection around about Job. But he told the devil, you can't kill him. What would have happened if the devil would have tried to kill Job? Nothing. It would have never happened because God is all-powerful. God is almighty. Yes, if we are off on our own, if we are not doing what we're supposed to be, if we're not living right, the devil has all access to us and he can snap us like a twig. What makes us strong, what makes us overcomers over the power of darkness and wickedness? It's the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the power that God gives us. It's not of our own accord, 
but it's what God has given to us because he is ever about protecting his people. And verse 3 states, For the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous. You know, the wicked can't harm you. They can attack you. They can do some bad things. They might be able to talk, gossip about you. And maybe we will have to suffer a little bit about from it. But really, the wicked can't destroy us. They can't do anything more to you than God permits. And what... And God never said that everything would be roses. He told us there would be trials. But when we get to the last part of that verse, in verse 3, it states, Lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. What is iniquity? It's sin. And when we sin, well, let me ask you this. What separates us from God? Sin separates us from God. That's what separated us from God in the first place. Disobedience, rebellion, sin. That's what separated Adam and Eve from God. Iniquity, sin. Why did the devil get kicked down to heaven? Because iniquity was found in his heart. Sin. Sin separates from God. And when we look at this passage here, we have a great argument for eternal security because this states that the person who is a follower of Jesus Christ can fall away from him says, states, lest the righteous, who are the righteous, those that are serving God, put forth their hands unto iniquity. When we sin, God's hedge of protection comes down because we are pushing him farther and farther away. And verse 4, the Bible states, do good unto the Lord, O those that be good, and to them that are upright in the hearts. So basically, we need to do good to everyone. And then we get, we've already started the prayer at the end. It is a prayer for justice. And in verse 5, As for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. But peace shall be upon Israel. So what did it say about those righteous that are uh, performing or doing acts of iniquity? The Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. Basically, he separated. And what verse comes to mind? I can picture it, and I've lost all words. <laughs> work for me, thou worker of iniquity. I knew you not. There will be many on that day that say, Lord, Lord, have I not done this? Have I not done that in your name? Workers of righteousness. But why did he say, depart from me? Because they were workers of iniquity. And that sin separated from God. And that sin cannot enter into heaven. It doesn't matter if they deliver people from demons. It doesn't matter if they lay their hands on the sick and raised up hundreds of thousands miraculously through the power of the Holy Ghost. But if there's sin in their life, it will separate them from God. And they will be cast into eternal torment because they chose not God. And when they chose not God, God was not able to be as the mountains around Jerusalem were. He was not able to be that hedge of protection for them because they chose not God. God will use a willing vessel. He will use who he has. Does that, that does not mean that they are living right with God and that they are perfect. But in the end, it comes down to their relationship with God. Have we not done this? Have we not done that? You may have done that, but I don't know you. Depart from me, thou worker of iniquity. So when we look at Psalm 125, there is trust in God for the believer. There is confidence in God and comfort for the person who is living right. But if that one, that one can look religious all they want, but if they are not living right, there is no peace for them. There is no comfort for them. Because iniquity has abound in their heart, 
they are pushing themselves far from God. But may we have a heart that hungers after God. The Bible states, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek, and ye shall find him. He didn't say he'd make it difficult. But, if we try to seek God, and try to enjoy the sins of this world at the same time, we're never going to have both. We may feel the presence of God move upon us when we're in church. We might even get the presence of God moving past us as a result of other people praying. But that does not mean on the final day that he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. That depends upon you, and that depends upon me. That depends upon your heart condition, and that depends upon my heart condition. Am I truly seeking God with my whole heart? Am I truly serving him with my whole heart? We sing that song, Oh, I want to see him, look upon his face. There I'll sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. But if we try to enjoy the pleasures of this world, which are short-lived, that will only be a temporary song for us. That will be our damnation because in hell, the worm never died. Our memory never fades. We'll probably remember everything clearer than we did in this lifetime. And all those times when we felt the presence of God and realized we don't feel Him in the same way anymore. All those times we had to get right with God and we just pushed it off. All those times when the Holy Ghost was moving in service, instead of when the Holy Ghost was moving on us to get right and deal with this with an issue, we just shouted off in a great church service and never went to the altar and got it right. To those who truly believe in God, to those that are seeking Him with their whole heart, He is peace, He is comfort, and He is someone that they can tr we can trust with our whole heart. But to the individual, who looks righteous but has iniquity in their heart, it will be their damnation. It will be their undoing. And on those, on that day, they will hear those unforgettable words, depart from me, I never knew you. May we have a greater desire than ever before to know God in a greater way. It's better for God to work on us now and get rid of anything in our lives that he wouldn't want there than stand on him, stand before him on judgment day and say, well, you should have had that right. You should have had that right. Well, God, I didn't know. Yes, you did. I remember when I dealt with you here. Remember when I dealt with you there. We may make heaven our home, but those little things will keep us from the greater things that God had planned for us and eternity. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything that they want to add at this point? If not, let's bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that your God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray, Lord, that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mind, <coughs> that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires. I pray, Lord, that you know the song leader and the musicians as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing, as they lead as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal of course. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips to bring forth the words you have us to sing. Here today, Lord, give him a special blessing as well, and anoint our minds and our hearts to receive your word with gladness, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that it would take root in our hearts, that we would apply it to our lives, that we would be changed even farther into your very image. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus.